All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, really appreciate you guys coming. And uh, thanks for your time after lunch. I know a lot of exciting sessions around. I uh, can promise up front, unfortunately, no AI or machine learning will be involved in, in this session. I know it's an exciting topic. But, uh, um, we'll be talking about endpoint security, endpoint protection here. Um, my name is Rene Kolga. I'm uh, with a company called uh, Nitron. Um, uh, I've been in enterprise software for about 20, 20 years, uh, primarily in the security space, worked for companies like Symantec, Citrix, Alteris, uh, and a number of uh, cybersecurity startups. So my expertise lie in systems management, endpoint security, encryption, and insider threat. So somehow always uh, got attached to, to the endpoint. Um, and um, so, very, uh, very exciting topic. Uh, hopefully you learned something, something new or, or have a refresher if you've done CISSP or other security trainings. Um, so, let's get going. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, know uh, Marcus Ranum, but he's kind of a famous uh, icon in the security space, especially in, uh, he's done a lot of work on firewalls. Um, early in the days. And then one of his uh, articles, uh, I saw this phrase, right? Cybersecurity is definitely still a hot topic. And why are we spending all this time and money and still having issues, right? Just think back to you know, last year with WannaCry, NotPetya, uh, Equifax, and on and on and on. It doesn't feel like we're getting much more secure. Um, so here's, uh, here's a question for you. When did he uh, say this? When did he make this, uh, this statement? Was it this year, last year, a few years ago? 20 years ago. 10 years. 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You win a prize, by the way, for the closest person who can guess. 15 years ago. 15 years ago, last month. Sounds pretty current, right? I mean, this thing. <coughs> So, so the answer is uh, 2005, so 13 years ago. So there was 10 and 15, I think 15 is the winner, right? Uh, so yeah, you, you'll get uh, a cool toolbox of all kind of goodies in it. So get it after, after the session. So, uh, but yeah, pretty, pretty wild, right? Again, sounds so, so today, so, uh, or maybe tomorrow, right? But it's already back in 2005. But uh, what's even more interesting uh, is there was, uh, so this is the article that he wrote called The Six Dumbest Ideas in Cybersecurity. If you haven't read it, uh, it's, it's a fun read. It's, it's very insightful. And uh, there he says that somewhere back already in 1992, the amount of badness exceeded the amount of goodness on the internet, right? A fascinating concept which has been known for a while, right? Uh, at least you know, I've been in security for, for, for many years, so I, I knew that this, uh, this has happened, but I didn't realize it was already 1992. That's like, oh, that's like before iPhone, it's crazy. Uh, so that's what, 20, you know, 26 years ago. Unbelievable, right? So. So why are we still chasing the, the badness? He calls this as one of the six uh, dumbest ideas is this enumerating badness. Right? If there is more badness than the goodness, why are we chasing the badness? Seems like counterintuitive, right? So, um, but the, the talk is called kind of your balancing positive and negative security, right? So, even if you've been in security space for, for a long time, it's a, known, it's a known terminology, but not really frequently used terminology. So let's do a very quick refresher on what the, these models are and what do they mean, actually. So how it works, which products, which security products are they used in typically, and what are the pros and cons of, of the different models. So. Uh, negative security, right? That's the, you know, define, uh, define what's bad and let <laughs> everything else in, right? Try to find those IOCs and, and block them 
and everything else uh, passes through. So it's, it's used in majority of your endpoint security products, whether it's uh, AV or next-gen AV, DLP, uh, and other products, all of them function in, uh, in the, the negative, they, they employ the end negative security model. And the, the pros, uh, pros there, it's, it's pretty easy to manage, right? Uh, the vendor, whether it's, you know, vendors in the, in, the, in the Expo, Semantic, and Silence, and others, they've done the work for you, right? They've enumerated the badness, and you just need to deploy the product and make sure it stays up to date. Um, and then uh, the cons is obviously if you, you know, open the newspapers and, and, and see what's going on, you know the protection is not perfect, right? I'm not saying it's bad and you should, you know, uninstall your, your AV. Absolutely not, right? But, you know, obviously the, the, the protection is not, is not perfect. And then uh, if we look at the positive security side, well, it works in a completely opposite fashion. Right, so it defines what's good, and then it blocks everything else. So, what the, what are the examples of products that use positive security model? Well, on the network side, firewall works in the, in this way. The only real application to the endpoint security of the positive security model has been in the whitelisting technology, right? You may remember Bit9, which is now Carbon Black, right? And Bit9 was famous for whitelisting technology, whitelisting capabilities. And, and obviously, uh, you know, tremendous benefits there because whitelisting provides really high level of security. At the same time, if any of you have ever tried to, uh, to deploy whitelisting technology, it's really hard to, to manage, right? Because as there are almost, as there are almost infinite number of attacks, there's almost infinite number of applications and they keep changing every day. So if, if your device uh, is point of sale or an ATM or maybe a web server, you can of course deploy uh, whitelisting. However, it's your regular desktop or laptop you know, good luck, right? Um, any any questions so far? Thoughts? No? Makes sense? Okay. So, so we, we kind of did a quick refresh on negative versus positive security. Um, now let's think about the, the attack kill chain. This is kind of a simplified four-stage uh, attack kill chain. You can look at, of course, seven stages in Lockheed Martin's uh, attack kill chain, but it's kind of the, the basic version of it. Um, the attackers try to get in, execute the payload, the infection happens, and then they cause damage to your system, right? Um, and where are most of the efforts going? Well, they go into the, that first stage, right? Whether the effort by the attackers they're trying to find uh, the, the next vulnerability, you know, those the zero days, uh, etc. As well as from the vendor perspective as well, um, that's where most of the effort goes into. While we at uh, Nitron believe that's, uh, that's an infinite battle, right? You, you can't win against infinite odds. Because human ingenuity is just so tremendous that there will always be another way of getting it. Right, it's exploit vulnerabilities. You know, just uh, just social engineering. Right, hey, just double click this attachment or enable the, enable that macro in the, in the, in that word document. Right, there will always be a way of getting into into the system. I like to say that the bad guys are just so good. <laughs> so, while if you think about this, what's the intention behind the attack? Right? Well, what are the bad guys trying to do? Well, they either want to steal the data, right? Espionage, exfiltration, data exfiltration, or they want to monetize your data directly by encrypting it, you know, ransomware, or they want to cause uh, damage directly, right? By wiping your files or corrupting your files, corrupting your MBR, your, your wiper malware, your NotPetya, and, and others, right? So that's 
that probably, those three things probably cover, you know, 90% of the, the reasons behind the attack, right? So, so, so while the attacks are infinite, the ways of getting into the system is pretty much infinite, the damage, the, the intention behind the attack is very finite. I mean, it's not just those three things that I, that I listed, but it's probably, you know, dozen or so, but very finite list of things. So why focus all of your efforts on the first stage, which is so large, while you can focus, while you can focus on the damage and, and, and try to prevent that? So that's kind of the theory that we have applied. Um, and then we took the, the positive security model, like the, the whitelisting, that's been pretty unmanageable, and uh, took a step lower into in the operating system at the OS system call level, and implement and and just focused on the damage. So we just care about data exfiltration, deletion, creation, corruption, editing your registry, and a few other things, you know, a handful of things. And so, how does it work? So imagine the system call comes that says, oh, I want to you know, open up an external communication with another system. Um, or I want to create or delete a file. Well, when that call comes, we, we say, we look at how did it arrive to this point, right? Did it follow a, le follow a legitimate path or not? If it did follow the legitimate path, the known the known good path of getting to that potentially dangerous, damaging activity, we allow it. If it did not follow the legitimate normative path, then we block it. Um, so there's an example, say, uh, data encryption is coming. And this time, it did not follow a normative path, then we deny it. So we don't care about how the malware got in, the attacker got into your system, whether it was an exploit or vulnerability or it was phishing, it doesn't matter. When the malware or hacker attempts to cause damage, that's where we see how did they arrive to this point? Did they follow a legitimate path or not? So, you know, how, how does this really work? You know, how, how is this really possible? Well, we've map every single legitimate way in the operating system to delete a file, for example. And there are you know, dozens. You can go on the desktop, right click a file, select the, the menu appears, select delete, then the dialog comes up and says, are you sure you want to delete a file? Yes or no? Click yes. So then you can do it through command line. You can do, there are you know, dozens of ways of deleting a file on, on Windows, for example. So we've mapped took us more than five years. We've mapped every single way legitimately to delete a file, every single way to legitimately re edit a register, every single legitimate way of opening a communication channel, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that's related to that potential damage uh, on the endpoint. And we block everything else. Does that make sense? I'm sure there, by now there are some questions. So, Confused looks, no? Makes sense? So it's, again, taking a positive security model, but being completely agnostic to the applications, being completely agnostic to user behavior, because applications, at the end of the day, they use OS system calls to create actions, to create files, delete files, communicate with, uh, with other systems on the network or in the cloud. So. That's why it's completely agnostic to the applications. Yes, question? Usually embed processes and pretend to be a good process. So it's usually it's the same stuff as our normal process. So if I understand your question correctly, well, can't an attacker simulate a legitimate activity, right? right. That's what they usually do. So, so actually, I, I, would, uh, I would disagree with that uh, because what do, what do attackers try to do? Uh, what does the malware try to do? They, the malware tries to stay, and attackers, hackers, try to stay as hidden, as silent as possible, right? They, 
you know, the last thing you want to see is the mouse moving on your screen without you touching the mouse. The last thing you want to see on your screen is some command line prompt appearing and someone typing them there without you doing anything. So the attackers and the malware is doing the exact opposite of normative behavior because they want to stay undetected. They want to stay silent and hidden. That's why your system like that works. Well, the next question comes, well, why can't attacker, knowing that say, oh, I'm you know, United Airlines and I'm protected by, by Nitron, and I know they watch for legitimate behavior, so I'm going to create malware that works exactly like a legitimate user. That's theoretically possible. Few problems with that. One, it means that the attackers will have to do the exact opposite of what they do today, right? Instead of being silent and hidden, they'll have to be as loud, as interactive as possible. That's one, that already a significant barrier, right? And, and two, more importantly, even if you can simulate maybe a legitimate way of deleting a file, right? Well, but how are you going to legitimately get onto the system in the first place? Well, okay, you deleted one file, but then you want to communicate with a command and control center on, on the internet. Well, how are you going to do that legitimately? Right, so, so when, uh, where the negative security products, they function as gates, right? If you figure out a way to bypass the gate, then you get a free access to the system. You can do everything you, anything you want on the system. With this solution, every single action will be tested. There's never a point where you have free access to the system. You try to get into the system, you check. You try to delete a file, you check. You try to communicate, you check. You try to encrypt the file, you check. So it's, a, it's what we call a persistent security versus the transient security. Does that make sense? So it's, it's a great question, and, and, and I hope the answer makes sense. Also. Other questions at this point? I know this is a very different concept from, again, most other approaches of most other security products. Uh, and when I first learned about this, I was like, well, I've spent like eight years at Symantec. I know, you know, and uh, other security companies, I know how the industry works, but I've never seen anyone do anything like this. So what are the benefits of this approach? Uh, yeah. I have one question. So, yeah, but So, so the question is, is there an endpoint agent? And uh, does it need uh, communication with, with a cloud or a server? So uh, the answer is uh, first yes and then no, right? So yes, there is an agent on the endpoint that's fully compatible with uh, your AV or next-gen AV. So we're not saying, you know, uninstall semantic or uninstall science. It's, it's you know, great together. Um, and, uh, and two, it actually doesn't need any connectivity with a cloud or with a, with a server per se, because full logic exists on, on the client, and it can work in completely air-gapped environment. It doesn't need any updates, any learning, sandboxing, cloud lookups, or any of that. So, so that's part of the, actually, um, of, of the benefits. Um, so there's no patient zero required, right? We don't need to learn about the attack in order to protect against it, right? It's, it's completely threat agnostic. It doesn't have any signatures, IOCs, you know, blacklist whatsoever. There's nothing to update. Um, it also doesn't have uh, any baselining machine learning AI. It's a state machine. There's no prediction. It's not a predictive system. Oh, you know, 79% likelihood this is malicious. No. It's either one or it's zero. It's either malicious or it's not malicious. That's how it functions. Um, as I mentioned, so support for air gap networks. You know, there's no connectivity needs whatsoever because there are no updates. Uh, I mean, of course, if you have a server on-prem and the, your client can communicate with it, it's great for forensic because we give you full forensic uh, view kind of EDR-like capabilities on how the attack actually happened, what did they try to do, etc. Um, then uh, another very unique uh, point here, a little bit goes back to your question uh, around persistent security, is that even if you deploy this solution 
on an endpoint that has already been infected, the, the very next time the malware or the hacker or attacker tries to cause any damage will be prevented by this, uh, by this solution. So, fewer false positives. I'm not going to tell you that we don't have uh, false positives. We do. Uh, however, why is it fewer than, than traditional approaches or next-gen approaches? Well, because it's not a predictive solution, right? Uh, and it's completely agnostic to the applications and the user behavior. So it's, it's a very manageable uh, uh, rate of false positives. And if you do get a false positive, it's literally, it can be solved in two clicks by creating an exception for your environment, for a particular maybe custom build application that functions in a weird way. So we can, we can uh, resolve those very quickly. Um, and then finally, it's, it's more uh, lightweight than, uh, than more traditional approaches. And of course, every vendor will tell you, oh, our agent is so lightweight, less than 1% CPU, you know, 50%, 50 meg of RAM only. You know, everyone says that, right? Uh, and, and the only thing you can do is, well, you know, believe in it or, or test and see if that's really true. However, and I'll tell you exactly the same thing, that our agent is very lightweight, but um, there is a reason behind that, and hopefully that will resonate with you. Uh, one, it doesn't, do, it doesn't scan the disk. So it doesn't do your know, static file static analysis or uh, any of that uh, stuff. Um, and then it doesn't have you know, those lists of IOCs and signatures that are you know, millions and hundreds of millions deep, nor it needs to update them and take you know, hundreds of meg of space on your disk uh, to do that. So, so the agent just doesn't, doesn't have those normally resource draining activities. It doesn't perform those resource draining activities with this approach. What's that? Okay, so on the fa false positives, uh, or, or the true positives, true positives. Yeah, does it report on true positives? Yes, um, obviously you can deploy the agent in a completely silent fashion without tray icon, without any uh, pop-ups, or you can enable pop-ups, so if, uh, if something got caught, the, the user will see it. And of course on the server side, there is a web-based console that you as an administrator access to, and there you can review all the true positives, uh, as well as false negatives, et cetera. So, and then we give you, as I mentioned, forensic trail on how did that malware get in to the system? Was it you know, drive-by download, outlook, et cetera? And then what did it attempt to do? Oh, it attempted to communicate with, to the CNC, then attempted to encrypt these files. Um, and we give you a complete visibility into that. If, if you stop by our booth uh, 27, uh, the expo, we can show you actually that forensic visibility, uh, how uh, we call it the storyline, that actually show, shows you the whole, the whole story behind each attack. So, yeah. so, so we, you know, we say this allows us to, to you know, I mentioned the threat agnostic approach, right? That allows us to catch uh, the unknown unknowns. But it, it doesn't really matter for us whether it's a malware from 10 years ago or it's the next you know, Stuxnet. We will prevent damage from, from old as well as new uh, malware, whether it's super sophisticated or super basic. Okay. So again, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, there's no baselining, no ML AI for this approach. We did the exact opposite of what majority of other vendors uh, have done. Uh, we, we learned every legitimate way to damage, and we block everything else. So that's exactly how, how we function. Any other questions at this point? No? OK. Um, and uh, I love this quote, and I had a chance to work with uh, Kurt at Citrix uh, a number of years ago. But again, don't, don't get uh, me wrong. We, we're not saying, you know, uninstall your, your McAfee or uninstall your, your, your CrowdStrike. Absolutely not. There is, there's uh, 
the tons of benefits in catching the bad guys at the front door, right, at your gate. The earlier you prevent the badness uh, from getting into your system, the better. So we, uh, we are all about defense and dev approach, right? Uh, security is the game of layers. So, so this, uh, this approach is, is very compatible uh, with any AV or next gen AV product out there. And you can just add it on top and it will add that different, completely different view uh, and, and try to stop the, the really nasty malware that was able potentially to bypass your primary agent, your AV or Defender or whatever you have there. And then we will prevent the damage uh, that it attempts to, to cause. And uh, so it's, you know, we are a startup, but uh, we've been around for more than five years. We have uh, customers in very sensitive industries, you know, from healthcare to to government, to transportation, to financial sector, uh, you know, that, that run our product in full, full production, fully uh, uh, preventative mode. Uh, and in every case, it runs as a secondary or last line of defense. So they have a uh, primary agent there as well, and then they layer us, uh, layer us in. So that's, uh, that's kind of uh, my short talk, hopefully was interesting, different. Um, if you have other questions, yeah. What kind of failures have you guys seen? Obviously, you're not perfect, no one is. So, yeah. where have you seen failures and how do you learn? Uh, so, yeah, great, great question. You know, uh, you know I hope uh, no vendor is, tells you that they're 100%, right? Do we 100% efficacy? I, I would really stay away from, from that, right? Uh, Normally, you look at third-party tests and whether it's 93% efficacy or 99.9% .9 efficacy, it doesn't matter, right? No one is perfect, and I will not claim that we're perfect either, right? Uh, so, but we do see, uh, you know, our, our efficacy in, you know, high 99 plus percent uh, 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 ratio. So, but uh, yeah, do, do, we, uh, do we see failures? Uh, absolutely. You know, we've mapped, uh, we've mapped the majority of ways to do damage on an operating system. But once in a while we discover another way, uh, another activity that we may not have mapped yet. And uh, if we do, and our customers tell us, oh, you haven't, you know, mapped the way, you know, this macro, whatever, tries to cause damage, then we'll map it. And the good thing about this, as soon as we map that other way of causing damage, it's, it's closed forever, right? It's, it, we, we solve that problem uh, forever, pretty much. So, so yeah, we've, and, and uh, have, we seen, uh, have we seen examples where we block uh, real nation state attacks? Absolutely. We've, uh, we've published a number of reports where we where we've seen attacks on the critical infrastructure coming from nation states uh, uh, that we can you know, attribute. Of course, most attribution is, is somewhat speculative, but uh, we, we've seen uh, incredibly sophisticated attacks that were able to bypass most other controls, uh, but we were able to stop, uh, stop those. And then uh, uh, we had a customer who had um, our product deployed only on their you know, desktops and laptops, but not on their servers. And then uh, they, uh, they detected, um, so something strange happened uh, with one of their servers. They deployed our product uh, on that server, and immediately they saw that the server was infected. Because, you know, as, as I mentioned, we will be, uh, even if the machine was infected before you install us, we will be effective, and the very next time, uh, the hacker or malicious or malware attempts to cause damage. So we notice that this machine was infe infected and was trying to spread across their other servers. Then they deployed us uh, overnight to about 400 other servers they had, and and then we unraveled a pretty pretty interesting attack that we'll be publishing a report about in uh, I think next week actually. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks so much for coming.
I appreciate your time. Stop by booth 27, we'll, we can show you a demo. Thank you. Thank you.